how can a world war be all about the Jews? In 1939, they are just 0.68% of the global population. The war in the Far East certainly isn't about the Jews. Even in Europe, Jews are only 2.2% of the population. Great Britain surely isn't fighting the war because of Judaism, nor is the Soviet Union, the United States, Italy, Japan, Canada, Australia, China, or for that matter, most other belligerents. Despite this, the war in Europe has everything, and I mean literally everything, to do with Judaism, or to be correct, anti-Semitism. So much so that when Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler finally realizes German defeat is inevitable in April 1945, he will reach out to negotiate, not with the United Nations Alliance, but to the World Jewish Congress. Why? Because from start to finish, the chief war goal of Nazi Germany has been the destruction of Jewry. I'm Spartacus Olsen. This is a World War II in Real Time special episode. Hitler is waging World War II to defeat the Jews. Okay, on the surface, this doesn't match his stated war aims. Even those who are very knowledgeable about this war will say things like, doesn't he want Lebensraum, or doesn't he want to destroy Bolshevism? Yes, Hitler does want these things. But they are both origins of the same desire to destroy the Jews. In order to properly understand this, we must consider the Nazi worldview, or Weltanschauung. It's based in ideas of social Darwinism and Malthusianism. It holds that the Earth's various races are in fierce competition with each other over the planet's finite resources – food, land, oil, etc. Hitler and the Nazis believe that the noble Aryan race has been prevented from securing the resources it needs and deserves because of a nefarious plot by the Jewish race. Now. For the avoidance of any doubt, Jews as an ethnic group, or even a subset of that ethnic group, have never and will never plan to control the world. Jews don't control Bolshevism, capitalism, the media, or anything else. In fact, to even talk about Jewry as some kind of homogenous thing is largely a falsehood, especially before the establishment of a Jewish state. Many Jews consider their Jewishness a distant second to their primary national or political identity. Those who consider it their primary identity are split across theological lines – Sephardi or Askenazi, Orthodox or not, degree of orthodoxy, and even ideological ones like liberal Zionism or socialist Zionism. But Hitler sidesteps any factuality by framing inaccuracies and contradictions as tricks to pull wool over the eyes of the world and destroy Western culture. And from this irrational point of view, the decision to destroy the Jews is not only completely rational, but a selfless act in defense of all mankind. Hitler makes this clear in an address to the Reichstag on January 30th, 1939. <laughs> Wenn es dem internationalen Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. But the Nazis don't begin the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe when they go to war in 1939. By the sound of it, it's all about Poland and the orchestrated threat the Germans claim that Poland is. Yes, Hitler justifies his invasion using familiar realpolitik clichés – Versailles, Danzig, and the Polish corridor – German minorities, Polish aggression. We've heard them all before with his previous annexations, but in the Nazi narrative, these reasons also go back to the idea that the Jews engineered Germany's defeat in World War I. Poland is, however, something more than the other annexations. It's an essential first step, a launch pad, if you will, for Hitler's ultimate goal of invading into the heartland of Judeo-Bolshevism, the Soviet Union, and finding a final solution to the Jewish question. But for now, while invading Poland, he has allied with the USSR in an effort to secure a position of strength when he will break that alliance and attack. He begins to plan for that attack in parallel to the invasion of Poland and while facing off with the Western European powers. Now, 
The vast majority of Polish Jews are not killed even after the invasion, except of course for those who are among the 150,000 Polish intellectuals, military leaders, politicians, and business leaders who are murdered. The rest are herded together in ghettos while the Nazis deliberate the method they will use to fulfill the Führer's vision of a Europe free of Jews. Some Nazis advocate deportation to Siberia or Madagascar where the Jews will perish from starvation and disease. Others believe in sterilizing Jewish women, ideas that will ultimately be dismissed as unpractical. But then, Hitler still doesn't attack the Soviet Union and his fantasy about Judeo-Bolshevism. Instead, he fights the West, although they are free market democracies and arguably can't have anything to do with Judeo-Bolshevism, right? Again, the conflict with the West doesn't look like it on the surface. For starters, it was the Western countries who declared war on Hitler. They certainly didn't do it because Hitler was killing Jews in Poland or because he had introduced anti-Jewish legislation in Germany. For Hitler, on a purely military level, it's an opportunity to knock out two major powers before he turns eastward to the USSR. But ideologically, the war in the West has also everything to do with the Jews. As he told the Reichstag in his speech in January 1939, Hitler believes that Jewish financiers are controlling the Western capitalist states and paving the way for Bolshevizing of the earth. They too are victims of the Jews in that respect. The German nation has no feeling of hatred towards England, America, or France. All it wants is peace and quiet. But these other nations are continually being stirred up to hatred of Germany and the German people by Jewish and non-Jewish agitators. So Hitler hopes that by waging a swift, victorious war, he can subdue the West and disarm the Western Jewish conspiracy. He thinks that this will bring Britain to his senses and the UK will give Germany a free hand in continental Europe to purge the Jews. But the Western powers do not see the world through this warped lens. The West isn't opposing Germany as part of a Judeo-Bolshevist plot. They're opposing a belligerent, expansionist Germany which threatens Western interests and do not come to their Nazi senses. This doesn't matter to the Nazis. As the conflict progresses and Germany is faced by resolute resistance from the British Commonwealth and eventually the United States, Nazi propaganda against the Western allies becomes increasingly anti-Semitic. Roosevelt and Churchill are portrayed as servants of Stalin and the Jews willing to give Europe over to Bolshevism. In early 1943, in his Total War speech, Reich's propaganda minister Josef Goebbels explains. Das Gefahr unmittelbar im Verzug ist. Die geistigen Lähmungserscheinungen der westeuropäischen Demokratien, die in ihre tödlichste Bedrohung sind, wahrhaft Herz beklemmen. Das internationale Judentum fördert sie mit allen Kräften, genauso wie der Widerstand gegen den Kommunismus in unserem Kampf um die Macht in unserem eigenen Lande von den jüdischen Zeitungen künstlich eingeschläfert. Und nur durch die nationalsozialistische Bewegung wieder erweckt wurde, genauso ist das heute bei den anderen Völkern der Fall. Das Judentum erweist sich hier wieder einmal als die Inkarnation des Bösen, als plastischer Dämon des Verfalls und als Träger eines internationalen kulturzerstörerischen Chaos. Nine months later, Hitler is yet clearer in what will be his last public speech in person. Es ist vor allem die völlige Schimmerlosigkeit, hauptsächlich die Bürgerinnen und Politiker, wenn in vielen Ländern getan wird, als glaubte man, dass der jüdisch-plutokratische Westen den jüdisch-bolschewistischen Osten überwinden wird. Nein, das Gegenteil wird eintreten. Eines Tages wird der jüdisch-bolschewistische Osten das Judentum des Westens seiner Aufgabe entheben, noch länger heucheln zu müssen. Es kann dann in voller Offenheit die endgültige Zielsetzung bekannt geben. Die jüdische Demokratie des Westens ändert nämlich früher oder später selbst den Bolschewismus. Und er auch doesn't mince his words when it comes to a secret union between the Western Allies and these imaginary Jews. Dass in diesem Krieg wieder England die treibende Kraft war, dass es Ursache, Ausbruch und Führung des Krieges mit den Juden zusammen in sich vereint, entspricht als Wiederholung dem Geschehen des Ersten Weltkriegs. So, 
Hitler believes that the Jews are behind all his enemies, whether they are capitalist, communist, British American, or Russian. It begs the question, if the Jew is then not just an empty slur aimed at Germany's enemies, whoever they are, simply a sloppy synonym? The answer is no. In the Nazi worldview, the Soviet Union is an entirely Jewish entity, the manifestation of the Judeo-Bolshevik menace which must be destroyed in order to give the Aryan race the Lebensraum and resources they deserve. Sure, they also plan to murder a large portion of the Slavs and enslave the rest. But that is in the Nazi Weltanschauung the natural next step. Eliminate the real threat, the Jews, and then weaken further and subjugate the other lesser races, including the Slavs. So, already before they invade the USSR on June 22, 1941, orders are given to eliminate Jews and other Soviet citizens who are agents of the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy. The Commissar Order separates commissars from regular Red Army soldiers for execution, but doesn't mention Jews specifically. But then, on July 2nd, head of the SS Reich Security Office and higher police, Reinhard Heydrich, clarifies when he orders his SS and police leaders to begin the liquidation of Jews in party and state positions. But Nazi ideology holds all Jews as part of the conspiracy by their nature, regardless of party membership or state position. So any pretenses at restraint is abandoned, and it quickly becomes pure genocidal mania. Without express orders, the SS Einsatzgruppen broadened the killing to all Jewish men. This is formalized and escalated further on July 31st, when the leader of the Office for Jewish Matters at the SS, Adolf Eichmann, Heydrich and Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring agreed to extend this killing to all Jews, regardless of age and gender, for the accomplishment of the final solution of the Jewish question. This begins the mass murder of Jewish civilians, men, women, and children in the Holocaust by bullets, which will take close to two million lives. Now, I've covered in War Against Humanity how this dynamic of escalation on the ground followed by formalization of the bureaucracy results in a ceaseless radicalization of killing. This accelerates the genocide from shooting to the industrialized murder in death factories that we most associate with the Holocaust. For more detailed view, watch my video about the Wannsee Conference of January 1942. Here the final solution is formalized and I recap the process thus far. Link will be in the description. So we must accept that this war began as a war on the Jews, but some might still argue that by 1943, at the latest, it's just a regular war between countries, the Axis fighting the United Nations alliance. Well, even as they are fighting and losing against the Allies, the Germans are continuing to pursue the genocide of the Jews. It makes no military sense and is understandable only through the lens of that warped Nazi ideology. The Germans defeated Denmark, the Low Countries, and France rapidly and comprehensively. These countries were all then pacified thanks to collaborationist regimes. There is no Judeo-Bolshevism to destroy here, no commissars, no party or state functionaries, no partisans, no former NKVD men. Yet the Germans are devouting an inordinate and illogical amount of manpower, resources, and infrastructure to the extermination of Jewish men, women, and children. In the German-Italian puppet state, Mussolini's Italian Social Republic, the Jews of Rome are being rounded up and deported even as the Allies advance northward up the peninsula. In the East and in Germany's client states, the situation is even more illogical. Germany is being pushed out of the Soviet Union. As they are retreating, they are still liquidating the ghettos, deporting and murdering any Jews still alive. The death machinery in occupied Poland is working at full capacity. Trainloads of Jews continue arriving from across the continent. And as the Soviets advance westwards through the Ukraine, the Germans are putting even greater pressure on the Hungarians and Romanians and Bulgarians to implement the final solution. At every step, genocide supersedes conventional military logic. It's impossible to acknowledge the targeted extermination of the European Jews and argue that this is a regular war. And yet, to the rest of the world, it is a regular war with the illogical, terrifying addition of the biggest genocide in known history. 
The rest of the world knows what is going on. Reports of mass murderers emerge, first as a trickle, then a flood. But in the Commonwealth, in the USSR, in the US, and in most occupied territory, the full ramification of the connection fails to be understood, at least on the emotional level. In some people, it even triggers sympathy and collaboration. Perhaps that is the reason that anti-Semitism is so prevalent in many parts of the world. Or perhaps because the absurdity of it all defies understanding. How is it possible for a regular lad from Shropshire, Kentucky, Victoria, or Vladivostok to understand that he is shot at and his friends killed because some lunatics thousands of miles away believe that he is the tool of a Jewish conspiracy for world domination. And to be clear, that lad is most certainly not fighting in a war that is about the Jews. For those defending their nation and others against German aggression, Judaism simply isn't part of the equation. And right there, you have the foul heart of Hitler and the Nazis' murderous miscalculation. Whether the Jews live or die, whether non-existent Judeo-Bolshevism is destroyed, the rest of the world will simply not tolerate resurgent German militarism and imperialism. And yet, as an ethnicity, the Jews will proportionally suffer the most in this war. The majority, 68% of the roughly 10 million Jewish people living in Europe in 1939, will be killed. Men, women, and children who have absolutely nothing to do with this war will be slaughtered in the most bestial fashion to fulfill the conspiratorial delusions of Nazi racial theories. In the process, the whole world will go up in flames. Tens of millions more will die and hundreds of millions suffer. That is what a belief in conspiracy theories and racial exceptionalism does. It creates cracks in the stonework of the dams we have built with concrete facts and hard truth to hold back the forces of hateful falsehoods. These cracks eventually widen and allow the followers of mythology and manifest destiny to unleash a flood of death and destruction on all of us. Never forget. Thank you.